Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. In the coming weeks I'll be looking more into the ancient Sumerians, a subject that I've been somewhat reluctant to tackle due to the huge amounts of noise surrounding it. Browsing the internet and scanning YouTube, the subject is dominated by clickbait tales of Anunnaki overlords, the so-called planet Nibiru that we're told is on its way back time and time again but never materialises, the genetically engineered slave race that mined gold and many other interpretations that have been taken by so many to be the real historical accounts of our ancient past. So before I delve into the history, my first real video on the subject needs to take a fresh look at the popular claims so I can make up my mind about what I believe based on the evidence available. The popularisation of the Sumerian myths is based on translations of cuneiform tablets made by Zechariah Sitchin, and this has triggered a generation of ancient alien theorists who have promoted the myth of overlord gods who from heaven to earth came. The foundation for the theory is Sitchin's series of Earth Chronicles books where he talks of a group of mythical beings known as the Anunnaki, who he claimed crossed their own DNA with that of Homo erectus in order to create humankind. And the reason? To use humans as slaves to mine gold and other precious minerals to save their own planet. And surprisingly, this is a narrative believed by so many. I read the comments on YouTube videos and I see a vast amount of content on the internet that so many people think that the Anunnaki were real physical beings who controlled mankind, so I wanted to create a video that looked at Sitchin's claims. From a personal level, I've never believed it, in the same way I don't believe that Osiris, Horus, Anubis and the like were living, breathing beings, but in the interest of fairness, I'll review the evidence. Many will disagree, I'm sure, but on this channel, you're entitled to your opinion and point of view. And if you leave a comment below, I'll try to read as many as I can and will no doubt make a follow up video the more I learn. I'm an open minded individual and I'm always willing to listen, even if I don't agree. Starting with the Sumerian gods, many modern sources claim that Anunnaki translates to those who came from heaven to earth. But according to every other eminent researcher, aside from Zechariah Sitchin, what it actually means is princely blood or seed of Anu. The Anunnaki were the Sumerian deities, a pantheon of gods who, in mythology, were the children of the sky god Anu and his sister Ki. But Anu's sister was not originally considered a deity, and therefore the Anunnaki should be considered demigods or semi-divine beings. Furthermore, Ki is the Sumerian sign for Earth, so the consort of Anu, the sky god, was the personification of the Earth. Their coupling was a symbolic union between heaven and Earth and there is no evidence to say that either god was a living, breathing being. Like the gods of Egypt, they were, in essence, personifications and symbolic. Still, Sitchin's books and a plethora of popular media have followed his lead into claiming that the Sumerian literature portrays the Anunnaki as a group of alien beings, who descended to Earth in winged flying machines and sometimes wearing spacesuits. Yet, there is no such depiction of the Anunnaki anywhere in Sumerian texts. They were never depicted as alien space gods in art or iconography, and the so-called winged crafts sometimes seen above crescents that alien theorists use as their evidence refer to the sun, moon and solar and lunar deities, not the Anunnaki demigods. Of course, these depictions are not showing literal flying machines, but they are clearly symbolic, and even if I'm wrong, and someone can somehow prove that they are in fact flying machines, the gods associated with them, the solar and lunar gods, had nothing to do with the Anunnaki. But taking the stories of gods literally is the main problem with Sumerian culture. Like the Gnostic origins of religion in the past, there were many levels of understanding attached to Sumerian teachings and iconography. The stories and teachings were esoteric and mystical. There is no evidence they were historical. So what about the claims that human slaves were created to dig gold for the Anunnaki? Well, Sitchin himself never provided a textual reference to support this idea. And why? Because there isn't one. In the twelfth planet, Sitchin claims that bel Nimiki, an exaltation of the god Enki or Ea, should be translated Lord of Mining. But there is no justification for such a translation, and Enki has no association with mines. The common translation of bel Nimiki is Lord of Wisdom, 
and this makes sense because Enki was known as the god of wisdom, often associated with knowledge and intelligence. No Sumerian text says that humanity served as a slave species to mine gold, and the idea of having Anunnaki scientists crossing alien DNA with primates is a complete, baseless fairy tale. The texts do state that humanity was created by the gods, but to assist in the process of creation itself. We all know that many religions say that gods or a god created humanity. This concept isn't unique. And then we get to another YouTube favourite, the planet Nibiru, the so-called planet X, the planet beyond Pluto that the gold that was mined from Earth was used to save, according to Sitchin. He claimed that it travelled through the solar system every 3,600 years. Dr. Michael S. Heiser has written a paper on Nibiru, and a variant of the name does actually appear in cuneiform texts. Drawing on the work of several experts, Heiser analyses all the known texts that mention Nibiru, and found that the term is only used in astronomical contexts to refer to three specific objects the planet Jupiter, the planet Mercury, and a star. Whilst it has a confusing meaning, Nibiru is certainly never identified as a separate planet beyond Pluto. By their own records, the Sumerians knew of only five planets, as well as the Sun and the Moon, and according to the ancient texts, Nibiru wasn't seen once every 3,600 years, but was actually observed every year. Why people believe the Sumerians had extensive knowledge of the solar system is unknown, and incompatible with what the Sumerians themselves recorded. They did record the movement of some stars, as well as the paths of the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, but beyond that, there is little more to report. Yet people still claim that the Sumerians knew about Uranus and Neptune, that they described the blue-green colour of these planets, which is a completely baseless claim, and seems to originate from Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, in which he freely mistranslated and misinterpreted the ancient texts. The fact is, there is not a single text that tells us that the Sumerians knew there were more than five planets, and this can be checked by anyone wishing to search the cuneiform library. Sitchin cites Cylinder Seal VA243 as his major piece of evidence that the Sumerians had acquired extensive knowledge of the planets from aliens because there is a famous image that many interpret as an image of the solar system we see a six-rayed star surrounded by 11 smaller dots. But as Heiser points out in his study, celestial objects with six, seven or eight points in Sumerian art always represent stars distinct from our own sun. In Sumerian art, our sun is always depicted in one of two ways, as a circle with four arms between which emanate four waves, or the winged solar disk. Neither of these symbols appears on VA243. But, in other art examples, the sun appears alongside the 6, 7 or 8 rayed symbol for a star, the same symbol misinterpreted by so many. This shows that the celestial symbols were not interchangeable and had defined meanings in the Sumerian cosmos. The Sumerians were consistent in their art, but if we are to believe Sitchin on this one cylinder seal, VA243, they went against everything they had done before and after it was made, and depicted the sun differently. It obviously makes no sense, and logically, it is of course incorrect. And if this was a picture of the solar system as many claim, why aren't the dots arranged more accurately around the sun? Why are they just randomly placed in a circular fashion? The truth is, all indications point to the fact that the Sumerians didn't see a solar system as we know, but they thought the five planets closest to us, as well as the sun and the moon which they tracked, were just objects in the sky. There is no data showing that the Sumerians had a heliocentric model of the solar system, and were probably more akin to flat earthers. They do discuss mathematical calculations of the appearance of planetary bodies in the sky, on the horizon, and in relation to other stars. It shows that they had a major interest in astronomy, but not that they had an understanding. Although this depiction on cylinder VA243 is quite unusual, six, seven or eight rayed star symbols feature on hundreds of Sumerian cylinder seals, and they always appear close to the head of a deity, and are believed to be a way to distinguish the gods from the mortals in imagery. 
But if this is a real depiction of the night sky, it is more likely to represent a fragmented comet or meteor swarm, or maybe a constellation. The Sumerians are well known for displaying the constellation of the Pleiades in many of their cylinder seals. There is no question that Sitchin's works, as well as the work of Erik von Daniken, led to a massive rise in the interest of ancient civilizations, and for that I'm grateful. But the claims really need to be scrutinised before being believed. The subject of ancient aliens is more of an industry than a true field of research, and I'm sure that is why the TV series was made. It's sensational, commercial and it sells. It was a way to cash in on an emerging popular idea that many believe is true. And evidence is presented in such a way that it seems hard to refute. But in almost every case it can be. But many do believe Sitchin and Von Daniken without question. And I do understand why. I don't deny that the subject offers an intriguing answer to the questions surrounding our ancient origins. And in the 21st century, with less people having an affiliation to organised religion in the Western world, and a rise in people believing in the existence of extraterrestrial beings, Sitchin and Von Daniken have filled a void within many of us. But as well as the accuracy in his translations, logically, Sitchin's claims make absolutely no sense. Apparently these gods had superior space travel technology that 21st century humans can only dream of. Yet the most efficient way they could mine the Earth's gold was to genetically engineer and create humans and then rely on their manual labour. Sitchin's claims that the Anunnaki had, and I quote, fiery rockets, indicates burning fuel, combustion engines. So how on earth did they travel into deep space? It doesn't seem very technologically advanced to me. And if they did master the forces of physics and biology, could they not make a synthetic equivalent of gold? And how exactly does gold save a planet? During Sitchin's life, Dr. Heiser wrote an open letter to him with 10 questions. 10 problems that underpin his Sumerian claims. Sitchin never responded, but that is probably because he knew his endeavours were more commercial than historical, and he did sell a lot of books on the back of it. But it is historical fiction, and certainly not fact. Just as many have done before them, Sitchin as well as Von Daniken have misinterpreted, mistranslated, and literalised ancient myths and legends. I would argue on purpose, to appeal to the human desire to find meaning in our existence, and to understand our past. But it is my personal belief that when studying ancient mysteries of the world, we need to start by looking on the earth, before turning our attention to the heavens for answers. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.